Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com and on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course, I always encourage you to subscribe to Food for Thought at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to leave ratings and reviews, share it with others, and of course, support the podcast to keep it going. This is a 100% listener-supported podcast, so just go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau right away, right now, this moment to support this work. My output of content is constant, especially if you follow me on Instagram And YouTube, you can see a regular stream of one-minute vegan videos to help answer the most commonly asked questions in one minute. And I'm really excited by the response I've been getting to these. Of course, I write articles, I produce this podcast, and lots of other uh, mediums of content production. Your support makes all of this possible, so thank you in advance. Today's topic is why almonds, avocados, and figs might not be vegan. Two quick notes before I start. One, remember those amazing vegan backpacks I raved about in the last podcast episode, the one about vegan France and Switzerland? Now you can get 20% off your purchase, which I'm so excited about. I might have to get myself another one. I might not be able to wait a year before I get the mustard colored one, which is the one that I've been coveting. But if you do order, you can get 20% off. This is uh, Arceo is the name of the brand, A-R-S-A-Y-O.com. And if you buy more than one, you get free shipping. So it's a pretty good deal, 20% off and free shipping if you get more than one, but you can just get one and get 20% off. So go to joyfulvegan.com, go to the Food for Thought podcast uh, episode at joyfulvegan.com called Vegan France and Switzerland, and you can get the discount code. Also, as of right now, we have a few spots, just a few spots left for the Vegan Paris and Alsace trip for 2019. We're almost filling up, which is fantastic, but I want you to have a chance to come. So if you are at all interested, go to cpgtrips.com, check out the itinerary, listen to the last podcast episode, and don't hesitate. Secure your spot today. I really don't know when we're going to be running that trip again, so don't miss out. Now, on to our topic. Why in the world would I even question the veganness of plants? Well, it all started in October 2018 on the BBC panel show QI. Now, QI is a British comedy panel show David and I have been watching for years. It features comedians answering questions that are very obscure, so it makes it very unlikely that the comedians will get the correct answer. And of course, zaniness ensues when they pretend they know the answer and don't, et cetera, et cetera. So QI stands for quite interesting. And the panel consists of four participants. There's three rotating guests and there's one regular guest, Alan Davies, whom I adore. I actually revolved our dates for our first trip to Scotland. This is many years ago. I revolved our dates around when we would go around a special stand-up show that Alan Davies was performing in Glasgow a number of years ago. So we went to see him, met him after the show. I got my little photo taken. And in fact, on that same trip, it turned out that David Mitchell, another regular guest on QI and a comedian and social commentator, was going to be in London the same time we were. So in that same trip, we also got tickets to see David Mitchell in a discussion. It was just a Q&A with his new book coming out. His new book was called Backstory, or his new book then was called Backstory, still is called Backstory. And I met him, and I got my little photo taken. So if you ever want to know who I fangirl over, it's British comedians. So QI was hosted by another one of my favorite Brits, Stephen Fry. Many of you know he's 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 quite unique and and QI, he's quite interesting. And he hosted that show for about 12 or 13 years. And he recently left. And he left the show in the very capable hands of Sandy Toxvig. And many of you know Sandy. If you watch The Great British Bake Off, she, along with Noelle Fielding, is she's now one of the new presenters along with Noelle uh, when Mel and Sue left. So anyway... That's who you'll hear. That's You're going to hear Sandy's voice. She is the host. She's the one who asks the questions. So I'm going to play a clip from that episode that caused the internet to blow up. Now, just to give you context, on the screen, they show almonds, avocado, 
melon, kiwi fruit, and butternut squash. And so you're going to hear Sandy ask the panel, what can you eat if you're a strict vegan? So how she says it. And so here, here we go. There's a bit in the middle that makes sense if you're watching the video. It's not really that interesting or relevant. So just listen through to the end. It's only about 90 seconds long. Which of these can you eat if you are a strict vegan? Uh, Any of them, uh, right? Uh, 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 no, why not? Was one of them made out of animals? Uh, no. So almonds and avocados, uh, all of them, in fact, it's the same reason as honey. Oh, they can't honey. exist without bees, and the bees are used in, well, let's call it an unnatural way, because they're so difficult to cultivate naturally. All of these crops rely on bees, which are placed on the back of trucks and taken very long distances across the country. Mm. It is called migratory beekeeping. Oh, God. And it's obviously... <laughs> <un> <laughs> Please, we can't look at the holes. You can't yeah. look either, can you? No. Has <laughs> it gone yet? No. Yes, it's yeah. gone. It's gone, it's gone. <laughs> so, it's migratory beekeeping, and it's an unnatural use yeah. of animals, and there are lots of foods that fall foul of this. Broccoli is a good example. Uh, cherries, cucumbers, lettuce, uh, lots and lots of vegan things that actually are not strictly vegan. Now, I hadn't seen the episode yet by the time the internet lit on fire. And of course, I would have been absolutely annoyed right away if I saw it. But as it was, I started hearing from a number of followers asking me what my response was, what I thought of it. And then major publications started writing articles about it. And major networks started producing segments about it with articles uh, and headlines like, are avocados and almonds vegan? TV host sparks internet debate. That's from the Today Show. Should vegans stop eating almonds and avocados? That's from ABC News. And sorry, vegans, if you don't eat honey, avocados might be off limits too, from the Washington Post, which has a not so slight ring of smugness to it, I think. Now, a similar controversy circulated around the internet a couple years ago with many vegans and publications hopping on the idea that figs aren't vegan because of the pollination process for some varieties of figs, a fascinating process at that, might I add. The result of millions of years of evolution, figs, which are more like inverted flowers than fruits, and fig wasps have developed a mutual relationship, each having the same goal, to reproduce. In order for this to take place, a fig plant needs to share its genetic material in the form of pollen with another of its kind. And the fig wasp needs a place where its larva can grow and feed. So a young fig wasp, female, leaves the fig she was born in and searches for a male fig in which to lay her eggs. The fig plant and the fig wasp are so interconnected that the male flower parts are perfectly shaped to hold the eggs the female lays. How amazing is that? So when she finds her male fig, she squeezes through a tiny opening to get inside. The opening is so small that when she climbs in, the wasp tears her wings and antennae, so she loses them. This means she won't be able to leave ever. She lays her eggs and lives the rest of her short life inside that tiny fig. Now her eggs grow inside the fig flower and hatch several days later. The newly hatched wasps mate with other wasps that were born in the same fig. And after mating, the males dig a hole in the fig that allows the females to fly out and find new figs. And so it goes on and on and on. The figs then release an enzyme that breaks down the female wasp's body into protein, the one who had remained there. In other words, the fig basically digests the dead insect, making it part of the resulting ripened fruit. Like most plants that reproduce using fruit, the fig tree's fruit ripen only after its flowers are pollinated with a grain of pollen from another tree. And this takes place because of the fig wasp. And despite what you hear, the crunchy bits, not I don't mean like here when you crunch the bits, but when you what you hear from people, despite what you might hear, the crunchy bits in figs are seeds. They're not the body parts of a dead wasp. So in the end, this is a sophisticated, remarkable process in nature. Also, this whole process takes place only in some varieties of figs. The majority of commercial figs are grown in California, like the popular 
black mission fig and the brown turkey fig. And the majority of these trees are self-pollinating. So it's not always the case that the fig tree relies on the fig wasp to pollinate. Most of the time, it's their self-pollinating trees. But no matter, that's an important detail that's often ignored because when this topic comes up, it's hyper-simplified and hyper-generalized in that people say, well, figs aren't vegan. So if you're vegan and you avoid figs, oh my God, are you missing out? I love figs. And that's your prerogative, obviously, to miss out on figs, but I'm not in your camp. And I think it's another example of vegans wanting to do the right thing, but kind of sort of losing the plot. Aside from the fact that this is a natural pollination process, aside from the fact that most fig trees are self-pollinating, so most of the figs you're eating most likely self-pollinated and didn't have this process. This is not what being vegan is all about. And I will confess, I think the publications, the bloggers, the broadcast news anchors, and Sandy Tuxvig on QI are as much to blame as are vegans for so badly and inaccurately characterizing what being vegan is all about. Some vegans, certainly not all. It's a small minority of vegans who so badly characterize what being vegan is all about. Unfortunately, it's what people glom onto and they think that's what it means to be vegan. As I said in a recent video I made about this, and you can see this at joyfulvegan.com, you can see it on Instagram, YouTube, one of the one minute videos I did, the fact that there's so much buzz around whether or not avocados, almonds, and figs are vegan reveals two things. One, that vegans haven't done a very good job clarifying what vegan means. And two, non-vegans love to play the gotcha game. No surprise on either count. First of all, there isn't a vegan overlord deciding what's vegan and what's not vegan. Second of all, imperfection is built into being vegan because we live in an imperfect world and we are imperfect human beings. In the 20 years I've been vegan. I've been drinking water that has most likely been filtered through animal bone char. I've been eating organic produce that has been grown most likely using animal manure, bone meal, blood meal, all derived from animals kept in intensive confinement and killed in industrial slaughterhouses. I've been buying wine and fruit from purveyors that most likely kill birds and mammals to protect their orchards. And I've been eating crops, including avocados and almonds, pollinated by migratory honeybees. And none of it makes me less less vegan. It just makes me more human. So what should I eat? Foie gras because my organic kale was grown in soil amended with chicken manure. Should I eat steak and chicken wings because fruits and nuts are pollinated by insects? The idea that we should do nothing because we can't do everything is illogical and self-defeatist. There's a lot we can't control in this world and there's a lot we can. Don't do nothing because you can't do everything. Do something, anything. But you say, the practice of using migratory bees for certain crops isn't the same as insects naturally pollinating trees, as in the case with the fig wasps. Commercial beekeeping injures and kills bees. Transporting bees to pollinate crops negatively affects their health and their lifespan. Migratory beekeeping, you say, is not the same thing as wasps naturally pollinating a flower. But I say that would be a false dichotomy as well. As long as there are crops... There is manipulation. That's what agriculture is. Manipulation of natural systems. Unless you forage for all of your food in your backyard or in your immediate area, and that's something that's really fun. If you can do that, that's fantastic. And I, I encourage you to do that. But it's not something you can rely on 100% for your food, for your nutrients. And because of that, you are dependent on agriculture. We all are, period, full stop. The agricultural revolution, which took place 10,000 years ago or more, started around 12,000 BC. The agricultural revolution changed who we are as a species, changed how we live, changed how we interact with each other and the natural world. Of course, it appears that it's given us a, the gift of security and settlement. And we were told that fairy tale for centuries, that agriculture is everything. I mean, it definitely changed us. You can't deny the impact that it had on us. But many now consider the idea that agriculture made us better you know, better, smarter species is just a fantasy. Here's an excerpt from Yuval Noah Harari, author of Sapiens. 
There is no evidence that people became more intelligent with time, which is one of the things that has been said for centuries about the agricultural revolution, about the results of the agricultural revolution on us as a, spe as a species. So there's no evidence that people became more intelligent with time. Foragers knew the secrets of nature long before the agricultural revolution, since their survival depended on an intimate knowledge of the animals they hunted and the plants they gathered. Rather than heralding a new era of easy living, the agricultural revolution left farmers with lives generally more difficult and less satisfying than those of foragers. Hunter-gatherers spent their time in more stimulating and varied ways and were less in danger of starvation and disease. The agricultural revolution certainly enlarged the sum total of food at the disposal of humankind, but the extra food did not translate into a better diet or more leisure. Rather, it transplanted into population explosions and pampered elites. The average farmer worked harder than the average forager and got a worse diet in return. The agricultural revolution was history's biggest fraud. Who was responsible? Neither kings, nor priests, nor merchants. The culprits were a handful of plant species, including wheat, rice, and potatoes. These plants domesticated homo sapiens rather than vice versa. Wonderful book, highly recommend it, Sapiens. And you don't have to look further than the almond industry to see a shocking visual demonstration of modern agriculture, particularly modern agricultural monoculture. Just drive down the Central Valley in California, which is not far from where I live, where the majority of the world's almonds are grown. It's absolutely stunning and hideous, in my opinion, to see row upon row upon row of almond trees for miles and hours on end. The almond industry is massive. It's worth about $11 billion, last I checked, um, to California's economy, which is intricately entwined with the American beekeeping operations for which farmers across the world pay beekeepers to ferry their hives into these orchards to pollinate those crops. California almond trees typically require 1.6 million domesticated bee colonies to pollinate the flowering trees and produce what has become the state's largest overseas agricultural export. Almonds, however, are not the only crops farmers hire migratory beehives for. Apples, avocados, beans, broccoli, carrots, onions, lettuces, tangerines, watermelon, pumpkins, squash, cherries, cucumbers, tomatoes, and hundreds of other fruits, vegetables, and grains all currently rely on commercially raised honeybee colonies for pollination. And so to vegans who don't eat avocados and almonds, you might want to add a few more plants to your list that you don't. Eat. In fact, you might want to avoid consuming anything grown through agricultural methods that you didn't, you know, forage naturally because of these types of practices and because of resources inevitably used, including fossil fuels, lots of water, fertilizers, even if they're vegan, it's a lot of resources. In other words, this very large, very entrenched system, this agricultural system is problematic, no doubt but it's not a vegan problem to solve. It's a human problem. Before European colonists brought the honeybee to the United States, native bees alone pollinated all the wild flowering plants and the crops grown by indigenous peoples. Of course, that was before we replaced diverse habitat with monoculture. The reason farmers rent bees is because we're wiping out native bee populations and because of these monocrops that are intensively farmed. A few vegans not eating avocados isn't going to address the issue because it's not a vegan issue. It's a human issue that farmers, scientists, policymakers, innovators, citizens like us all together need to solve. We need to encourage policymakers to help solve these problems. And we see some solutions on the horizon, but we need to frame it in a much larger context than a vegan purity issue, because it's so much larger than that. Just as there are fig wasps, there are a whole host of other pollinator insects who co-evolved with many of our fruits and vegetables, blueberry bees, squash bees, and orchard bees, to name a few. They're really good at pollination, but they're disappearing. And we, you, me, vegan or not vegan, can have a huge impact on their comeback and survival 
But you know what? It takes more than just virtue signaling that you're not going to eat avocados, figs, or almonds and criticizing others for not doing the same. I'm not saying every vegan who's trying to make a more ethical choice is virtue signaling, but let's be honest, many are. And many just do. I realize that a lot of it is from the intention to do the right thing. I get that. But it sometimes devolves into sanctimony, into claiming the moral high ground, into virtue signaling. All that is really easy to do. It's really easy to sit back and just say, well, I'm not going to eat avocados and I, I'm not eating them because, because bees are used. That's really, that's the, like, that's the easiest thing to do. Like, that's the easy thing. <laughs> and it does nothing to help solve the problem. The things that actually make a difference and that are oodles more effective take time. They require vigilance and consistency. They require vision and they require having a long view. If you recall from the interview I did on this podcast with Nancy Lawson about her book, The Humane Gardener, one of the biggest problems native bees face is A, definitely being pushed out by non-native honeybees and B, our desire for neatness and uniformity. We like pretty lawns with no bare spots. We want neat yards with no twigs and debris lying around, non-flowering grass, pollen-less flowers. We use pesticides. We spray herbicides. We put poison out for animals we deem undesirables. We clean up sandbanks. We clean up fallen leaves and brush piles all places where a native bee might have made her home and found a snack. In other words, habitat loss, pesticides, and decreased floral diversity all take a toll on these little animals. It's not enough to set aside special pieces of land, like a few isolated spots. That's not enough. Bees can't just appear for a week, pollinate your plants, and then disappear. They have to have something to eat the rest of the year, and they need a place to live. We can't save the bees by conserving little bits of habitat here and there. We have to include space for them in our agricultural lands, in our city parks, and wait for it, in our own yards. Even someone who has a postage stamp size yard or a balcony, if you can fit some plants on it, you can do a lot. So the question is, are you willing to make the effort? Let me name a few things you can do and you can decide if you want to do them. This bears repeating. A lack of flowers is one of the main factors behind the decline in bee population. So if you want to help bees, create bee habitats. Plant pollen-rich flowers galore. So get out there and plant a garden in your outdoor space. If you don't have a garden, work with neighbors. Maybe they have a garden. You can start. I mean, there's so many strips of grass, lawn um, that you see all around. Work with your city council members to create bee-friendly public spaces, bee-friendly parks, bee-friendly road verges. So you can make sure that, you know, the medians in the middle of the road uh, on freeways or on busy streets those trees can be flowering trees to attract bees. Fill your garden and all these gardens I'm talking about with a variety. Really important to have a variety of native flowering plants because remember, wherever you are, bees in your area, there are 25,000 um, types of bee. Like So we're talking about a lot and they've co-evolved with different plants. So where you are, Find the native flowering plants that are rich in pollen and nectar. Avoid ornamental hybrids that have been bred to produce little or no nectar. And you can ask your local nursery for recommendations. A lot of nurseries have like a bee-friendly section. Don't forget to provide water. You've heard me say a number of times that wildlife needs water. So fill a bird bath or a tray with large pebbles and water to allow bees to safely drink without drowning. So they'll stand on the rocks and then they can uh, they can drink the water and rinse, of course, and refill that every few days. Avoid using insecticides and pesticides should go without saying. And create nesting places by keeping some parts of your yard unmanicured. Nancy and I talked about this. Most native bee species don't live in hives. They lay their eggs in tunnels in the ground or in hollow, hollowed out plant stems or in dead trees or fallen logs. So don't be so obsessed about having a perfectly manicured, perfectly pristine yard. If you have a lawn, get rid of it. It serves no wildlife. <laughs> and, and 
people who have lawns, I hear them complain all the time about gophers and how, if you don't, if you're just, if you've got a space, a wild space that just has plants and flowers and flowering trees, you're, I mean, yes, of course the gophers can come and hurt those plants as well. And you know, that's, that's called coexisting. We have to find a way to deal with that. But most of the time when people are complaining, it's because of lawns. So replace your lawn with a pollen rich flower garden or at least let it grow some weeds like dandelion and clover. Again, bees love these plants and we call them weeds. They're plants <laughs> to the bees. If your spouse asks why you're not mowing the lawn, just say that you're doing your science backed bit for bees. Oh my gosh, I love alliteration. So there's also a movement among farmers to restore wild habitat by planting a mix of native flowering shrubs on fallow fields near croplands. I've seen farmers, I've seen some local farmers, they have the almond trees, for instance, or whatever fruit trees, I'm using that as an example. And then there's lots of lavender and lots of um, flowering shrubs all around the the cropland. So that's something that more and more farmers are starting to do. Not everybody, obviously, not these massive, massive, um, you know, I, I don't think the, al the almond industry is doing it yet. But scientists have shown that newly planted wild habitat attracts native bees, which increases crop yield and makes honeybees themselves more efficient. So honeybees are not great pollinators, which is the irony of it all. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And of course, there's an increased yield, which is high enough to recoup the cost of setting up a new habitat in the first few years. So talk to local farmers. Find out what your local farmers are doing. If you go to the farmer's market each week, if you go to a farm stand, find out what they're doing. I I have said a million times, I'm very lucky. I'm very grateful to live in California. I live here on purpose. We pay to live here. It is not a cheap place to live, but I am very grateful to be able to do so. And there's a farmer's market every day of the week near me. So I go to my two different regular ones on, on Saturdays or Sundays, and I see the same farmers all the time. And I can ask them questions. I encourage you to do the same thing. And, you know, lots of places I'm also seeing... I haven't been to Whole Foods in a very long time, but I remember <laughs> being there, for instance, as an example of a grocery store that's mindful of local farmers. I believe they will note if it's lo if it's a local farm that some produce is coming from. Find out the name of the local farm. You know, it's just a matter of finding out who's growing our food and how it's grown and then talking to them. So I actually was really excited. I kind of did a Google search to poke around for myself, and I found the names of some farms that I recognize that I see every week at the farmer's market. So if you go to pollinator.org, it's a really wonderful resource for everything I'm talking about, for plants that you can uh, plant, flowers and shrubs that you can plant, what native plants are in your areas, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a wonderful resource just in general. But you can also see under the Learning Center, there's a farming and ranching section. There's a page called Farmers and Their Stories, and you might find a farmer there. You can also just do a Google search uh, for farmers, you know, just to kind of type in your region, your area, what farmers use wild native pollinators for their crops. One of the things that will come up when you do that is you're going to see farmers who boast about using honeybees to pollinate their crops. And unfortunately, there's a lot of talk in the media about declining bee populations. That's that's good. That's the fortunate part. But unfortunately, immediately everyone starts talking about the honeybee. And I mentioned earlier, this is the European honeybee, a social bee species that has been domesticated for crop pollination and honey production. They are a livestock animal. I mean, they are absolutely just used for honey production. They're, it's no different than farming pigs or farming cattle, the way people farm honeybees. And because of this myopic way of thinking about just one domesticated species, rather than talking about all the wild animals, all the wild bees, people immediately think, well, I'll keep honeybees and I'll keep beehives as a way to preserve and protect bees and as a way to increase pollination. Cities promote beekeeping as a way to conserve pollinators. And as a result, it's on the rise in the US and the UK. Again, good intentions, but only part of the story. And an example of how something that we think is good is actually doing more harm. It's great to see people wanting to do something. And I applaud anyone who wants to do something and act rather than just talk. Um, so I'm glad about that. But managing hives 
does nothing to protect wild pollinators. As Nancy writes in her book, it's the equivalent of farming chickens to save wild birds. Think of it that way. These are, these are like I said, livestock animals, basically. And having honey bees and keeping honey bees and keeping hives does nothing to help wild bee populations because they compete directly for nectar and pollen. And that's not a problem when flowers are plentiful, but in environments where resources are limited and as I said, there's such a decline in flowers and pollen rich flowers that wild bees are being outcompeted by honeybees. So a lack of flowers is one problem, as I said, that we can rectify. And initiatives such as urban beekeeping are putting more pressure on wild bees and they're worsening the decline. Honeybees are extremely efficient at collecting pollen and returning it to their hives, but as a consequence, they transfer very little to the flowers they visit. So they're quantifiably less effective at pollination than wild bees because they bring it back to the hive. So we can solve this. There are, as I said, more than 25,000 bee species globally. So if you start planting pollen-rich flowers, you can be sure you will start attracting native bees. So the problem we have at hand isn't vegans eating avocados or almonds or figs. The problem is that we're wiping out native bee populations. The problem is that crops are intensively farmed. The problem is monocrops. This is not a vegan problem. It is a human problem. But this gets missed when we use vegan as the barometer for every ethical or cultural issue we have. This is what happens when you try to make vegan a huge vat that encompasses every problematic practice on the planet. And there's a new trend among some vegans who think they're broadening the definition of veganism, but who in fact are narrowing it. Vegans who say, well, you're not vegan if you're not also an animal activist. That's one of the things that's happening right now. Vegans who say you're not vegan if you don't also buy only fair trade certified products. Vegans who say you're not vegan if you eat products with palm oil. Vegans who say that if you eat sugar or drink wine, whether you know if they've been filtered with animal products or not, then you're not vegan or you're not a real vegan, which is the insult du jour. Are you kidding me. This isn't non-vegans calling out vegans for not being perfect. These are vegans <laughs> doing this. None of these things are about being vegan. They're related to being ethical and conscious and mindful. And vegan stands next to each of these under an umbrella of consciousness, right? But being vegan doesn't mean all of these things. Being vegan is hard enough for most people. Just not eating Three things, meat, dairy, and eggs, or add honey, right? So meat, dairy, eggs, and honey. Four things. Not eating four things. People have a hard enough time with that. People choose to have heart attacks or go against their own morals rather than stop eating meat. And you want to make it harder? You want to add more criteria to the definition of being vegan? You want to make it 10 things? You want, you're want you only vegan if you avoid eating meat, dairy, eggs, honey, sugar, wine, figs, almonds, avocados, palm oil, and anything that's not labeled fair trade, seriously? It's fine if you don't want to buy anything that's not fair trade. That's fine if you want to avoid palm oil. But for those who don't buy fair trade or for those who do eat products with palm oil or those who eat wine, figs, almonds, avocados, or sugar, but who also don't eat meat, dairy, and eggs, they're vegan. Because let me tell you, the more criteria we add to what it means to be vegan, the narrower the gates through which people can walk become. Fewer people will qualify. Fewer people will meet the criteria. Fewer people will become vegan, and that sucks. Sucks for them, sucks for the animals, sucks for the earth. Is that what we want? Is that what we want? Is for our already small population to be smaller? Probably not. Nobody should be standing at the gates as an overseer. But for theoretical purposes, the only price of admission in my book is that we don't eat animal products. Whatever motivated you to become vegan, how you eat, what kind of diet you eat, what your political views are, whether you're an activist or not, th those are not the criteria for being vegan. And so I'm vegan and I eat avocados and almonds and figs 
I'm an imperfect human in an imperfect world using this thing called vegan to reflect my values of compassion and wellness. Being vegan is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got. And it's pretty darn good for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thanks for listening.